Great. Thank you very much, everyone. And today's discussion is going to be centered around the remaining energy showcase. And the theme of today's discussion is going to be centered around alternative power options. And I have, we have a very good list of uh, uh, panelists here that we want to talk about, particularly options in renewable energy and, and power options. So to kind of kick things off is that, you know, in today's virtual world, power is at the core of making everything else possible. And, you know, power can be devastating to the operation should power be off or should not be available at any given point. And that's really kind of what we want to talk about today. So I have a group of panelists here. Uh, I'm going to go through each one of them. And then if you wouldn't mind uh, going through your name, your company in a uh, short description, then we can kind of kick off into some of the actual discussion. So Henry Brandhorst, Managing Director of CHZ Technology. We also have Bill Conlon, President of Pantel Power, and also Kobe Nagar from, he's the CEO of 374 Water. So Henry, if you wouldn't mind just giving a little bit of a background about yourself and the company, please. I'd be happy to. Uh, I've been in the energy business for about uh, almost 60 years now, starting with solar energy and uh, worked for NASA and uh, developed the technology that's flying today. But since uh, leaving NASA and uh, going through several different iterations, we are now working with CHZ Technologies that has the rights to a technology called thermalizer that takes uh, all hydrocarbon materials, converts them into only two byproducts, one, two things. One, a clean synthesis gas, fuel gas that can be used for making energy, be it steam, be it electricity, and byproducts, which if you're using tires as a feedstock would be steel and carbon black. The unit runs 24 seven. And the basic idea is for sustainability at a base, you'd like anything that comes into the base to be reused to generate energy so you send nothing to the landfill. So the pallets that you bring uh, supplies in on, the wrappings of those, the food trays that you have, all would be converted into energy for use there on the base and uh, on a 24 continuous basis. So that gives you a brief summary of that, uh, of our technology. Thank you, Henry, that was uh, very interesting. What about you, Kobe? Uh, so first of all, Alex, thank, thank you for having, having us today here. Uh, we are excited about being part of FWorks. Um, I am the co-founder and CEO of 374 Water. Um, 374 Water is reimagine how our energy can be can be used and be utilized. And we do that with a technology that's called supercritical water oxidation. What we actually realized that in, in human waste and food waste, there is actually a lot of energy on a, on a dry basis. It's about a third of a jet fuel. And what we're doing with, with our cycle is addressing wet waste uh, and converting it into energy and water. Uh, so really excited to be here. Great. Thank you, Kobe. How about you, Bill? Hi. Uh, well, good day, everybody. Uh, I'm Bill Conlon. Uh, I'm the founder and president of Pintail Power. Uh, we got our name from the California duck curve, which uh, represents the challenge of uh, renewable integration when we have too much sunlight at certain parts of the day that uh, depresses prices, drives uh, uh, thermal plants offline. And then when the sun sets, uh, those plants have to come back on uh, very quickly. So what we do at Pintel Power is we're named after that duck and we bridge the renewable uh, generation, the solar or wind power with the thermal generation. And the result of that is a synergy that results in first of all, the lowest cost of energy storage, less than $25 per kilowatt hour on an AC basis, far less than batteries and the, the highest fuel efficiency of any uh, gas fired or liquid fuel fired uh, uh, thermal plant. And in addition, there is enormous flexibility. The way we do this is uh, through electric heaters uh, to heat a thermal storage medium. 
And the charging itself brings great flexibility, including frequency control and so forth. So we think that that technology is great for the grid, but it also can, uh, can bring a reliability, resiliency, and readiness to facilities for microgrids. And uh, that's why we're very happy to be part of AFWorks. Terrific, thank you, William. So I'm uh, Alex, I'm the director of sales for a company called GenCell Energy. It's an Israeli-based company is utilizing hydrogen fuel cell technology both for backup power as well as primary power. But the claim to fame that we have is that, you know, in, in no other time has fuel cell technology been able to utilize uh, a, a clean fuel to generate power on demand as well as for primary power. Uh, we're actually using a uh, anhydrous ammonia in order to harvest out the hydrogen in order to continue to feed the fuel cell to create that chemical reactive process to generate power in an off-grid application. It's a fully closed loop system, but it gives you the ability to have all the great attributes of fuel cells where there's no emissions, there's no combustion, there's no noise, there's no vibrations. It's basically a computer that generates power, but it gives you the ability to, to really uh, generate the power in a sense that uh, you don't have to worry about whether or not you're gonna have the power required. And at the same time, it gives you the ability to have the attribute of almost being in a stealth environment because unlike traditional uh, generator uh, systems, uh, you don't have the noise or the emissions or the, even the heat signature typically associated with these types of systems. So literally you can have a black box that creates no indication that you're actually generating power, which in certain applications, particularly in the military, would be very useful. So moving on into the, the actual topics of discussion today, you know, one of the key things that we want to talk about is the risk to supply chain. So uh, Henry, how does your technology offer an alternative fuel source that can mitigate the risk associated to supply chain related to conventional fuels? Okay, one of the very interesting thing about the thermalizer technology is that this uh, synthesis gas or fuel gas that's created contains all of the building blocks necessary to create liquid fuels on site. It also has copious amounts of hydrogen, so it fits very well with the fuel cell technology that you just discussed. Uh, the, you, of course, you have to extract that from the mixture. So with uh, well-known off-the-shelf technologies, our mixture of uh, fuel gas can be turned into liquid fuels that replaces those tankers that are either helicopters that are bringing it in or tankers that are having to carry it in a very dangerous manner to a, a, a base. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I, and I can certainly see how, you know, the supply chain could be disrupted, particularly in off uh, bases around the world to where, you know, sometimes that's one of the most dangerous missions is actually getting supplies to from point A to point B. So having your own power generation system on site that not only can power the, the entire base, but even as a point of use for alternative fuels like hydrogen, as you mentioned, could definitely be a critical uh, aspect to uh, resiliency. Uh, Bill, what about on your end? How, how does this fit into the supply chain system? Well, we, uh, our systems are really for uh, fixed base uh, locations where, uh, where there uh, presumably is infrastructure, a, a, a gas or, or a fuel supply. But the important thing here is that uh, these, the, the disruption that we might be concerned about might be a disruption of the grid where the base then needs to be uh, electrically islanded in order to continue its mission. And there, the combination of very high fuel efficiency and the ability to integrate virtually uh, endless uh, amounts of PV, far more than the load, and store it, uh, it really extends the runtime of the fuel supply that you would have, uh, have on, on hand. And so I think that's really the kind of, uh, of application that we would look at to be able to uh, run this system isolated. But in the normal course of events, uh, the fuel savings is an important day-to-day uh, -day, um, impact for, uh, for base operations. Absolutely. And, and, and knowing a little bit about your technology, Kobe, um, I understand that a lot of the waste, as you mentioned in your introduction, is something that you know, a lot of these bases and military installations have to manage. So tell us a little bit more about how this material that's typically considered as waste 
can actually be turning into something else and at the same time take care of the waste uh, that you're producing on a regular basis. Oh, that, that, that's that's a great a great point. I think you know if we look on the on the macro, what we're trying to to achieve is a world that you don't have waste in. That you know you move from this linear approach of using something once and then throw it in the way into a more of the circular economy that you actually reuse material and and you know tap into that to that source. What's what's nice about you know the technology, and I think all of us are sharing that those 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 attributes is it can actually tap into something that right now we call waste uh, that is costing money for um, for the military to get rid of. You actually need you know it, it, you need convoys to 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 bring in fuel and bring out uh, waste. And what about you know? How how can we how can we break that you know that cycle? How can we tap into that source? Um, we at 374 thinks that waste is the ultimate resource, and the technology that we bring into the market is actually able to tap that and tap into that and produce energy um, and and water. Uh, and I think that's kind of critical if you want to get into into an island operation that you are completely self-sustained. Right. Alex, could I just jump in on this because that's a really important point that Kobe made uh, right. about waste and to reconsider waste. And uh, this panel inspired me. You know, when we think about um, a waste, often in, in solar PV, the waste there is there's more energy than we can use at the moment. And so to reimagine also what waste is. Uh, whether you take it from a Toyota production system viewpoint or something else, but I think uh, really the opportunity to turn something that is normally considered waste into something that has value. In our case, we do it by providing really low cost means of storing it. But clearly on this panel, you can see all sorts of other ways of approaching uh, that problem and reimagining not just energy, but, but, but waste also. No, that's a great point, uh, Bill. And, you know, Kobe, maybe if you can get a little bit more into the details about what is the waste that you're consuming as part of your process? And then what elements are you converting those into? And what is the actual impact to the base or military installation that would be valuable for them to consider this type of technology for? So, so right now we are actually focusing on, on the material that cannot be, cannot be burned or cannot be disposed any, any other way. We're talking about wet waste that have you know low low calorific value, low solid percentage, and what we are able to to do with the with the supercritical water cycle is do all of that and and react all of that material in a in a water media. So that's that's allowing you to you know be energy efficient and and treat waste in a different way, but also uh, harness the property of water. Um, at, at those uh, super critical condition, uh, which actually generate, you know, very clean water, almost, you know, drinking water um, uh, standard, but also distilled water that can work with, uh, with fuel cell systems. And, and those can be, you know, harnessed again to, to, make, to make hydrogen. And, and, you know, that's actually creating the opportunity to create more and more, more of those cycles. And, and again, tap into, into the resource more and more and more. And I think that's kind of the vision for us and what, what we want to, uh, to put out. Um, in, in terms of, you know, different type of waste that we treat, it's, it's a large variety, you know, anywhere from, uh, from human, human waste, fecal matter, uh, into, into food waste, uh, plastic paper, you know, so every anything that you can think of that is that is organic or carbon chain. Yeah, let me. I think that me... you know that the common theme, real quick, is that you know the common theme is that we're talking about the islanding, right? So when you're in a base, you know, you have all you need to bring in typically all the supplies. You know, like if you're in Hawaii, you have to bring a, a good portion of the material from the mainland, and it would be very similar to a base. So in this case, what we're talking about is that, you know, all the consumption, all the waste that we're doing, the energy requirements can almost be done within the parameter of what we're, all this technology can achieve. And I believe, Henry, your technology can also uh, create a certain amount of, uh, or actually consume a certain amount of waste that typically would be going into a landfill or having to be disposed of. 
So maybe you can go a little bit more into the details about what materials go into your process and what are some of the benefits of utilizing those materials? Be happy to. In fact, one of the major feedstocks would be plastic. And most folks don't realize that many of the plastics we have contain as much energy per pound as does a pound of gasoline. Hmm. So you wouldn't throw away a pound of gasoline. Why would you throw away a pound of plastic? And the reality is that only about two of the seven types of plastics can be recycled, uh, maybe a half of another one, but uh, they're mostly sent to landfills. And uh, the thermalizer technology takes all seven grades of plastics, converts them into high quality energy 24 seven, and the byproduct of those plastics is a biochar that can go to enrich soil, be put back onto the ground to enrich soil. I mentioned earlier, if you're using tires, which are a terrible problem, you get steel and carbon blackout. With plastics, you get biochar. With wood, you get biochar. So all of the materials that come into a base, one way or the other, uh, can be turned back into energy. Uh, with uh, the thermalizer system. And we're more than happy to have Kobe take all of the liquid wastes, the more liquidy wastes, the food wastes, and uh, other materials uh, and convert those into energy. It's a, a fit that makes sense. Right. And I think, you know, with uh, you mentioning that, you know, you can also produce hydrogen from your process that also enables the forwarding operating basis to utilize this uh, hydrogen fuel cell technology, whether in hydrogen form in terms of consumption, indoor ammonia, and give you point of use applications that would be very uh, critical in the overall mission quality to ensure that you, know, you always have power when you need it and you don't have to bring it in from some other location. You can actually right. harvest this energy, produce the energy, and be able to utilize it as necessary for all these various applications. And we mentioned earlier the ability to manage power. Uh, on uh, General Hinton's talk, he talked about the ability to manage energy, manage power. And with an integrated base, you're able to do that. And uh, that's what's important. What about yours, uh, Bill? Tell me a little bit more about your applications. Have, do you have any systems already installed throughout the world or what stage are you in? Well, we are, we are looking actually still for uh, serial number one, and uh, uh, there's a range of applications. We have uh, interest from uh, utilities. We have a program underway with uh, Electric Power Research Institute and uh, Southern Company, uh, and another one with the Southwest Research Institute. Uh, our commercial activities are uh, really aimed at uh, utility applications, and uh, we are in discussion with developers uh, to, uh, to deploy these systems. I think... Um, the, the interesting thing about the future of this is that uh, we, we know that we need to decarbonize. And so one of the things that uh, our technology does is it cuts the carbon emissions in half immediately. And so there's a big chunk right there. And then the question is, well, where do we get the rest of that? And I think it's through things like hydrogen or recycling of, of waste products. Alex, you mentioned point of use. Uh, it's likely that much of the hydrogen for power generation will need to be point of use. Our pipeline infrastructure uh, is not set up for hydrogen and uh, 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 hydrogen is uh, uh, challenging to, uh, uh, to compress and transport long distances. So uh, I think as, as one looks at this for uh, base applications of whatever scale, uh, point, uh, uh, the point of application is really important as we go the rest of the way in uh, decarbonizing. Oh, that's a great point. What about you, Kobe? Yeah, I, I, I really agree with you. I, I think, I think the, the idea of, you know, basically treat at, at the source or use at the source, that, that should be the guiding, guiding principle of a more sustainable society. Um, I think, you know, all of us are, are driving uh, towards that goal. And, and the more the more we can direct our effort, the, the better the better we, we're going to be. Um, yeah, I, I, I kind of wanted to add about you know what's the what's the environmental aspect of, of what all of us are doing and, and decarbonization is one of it. 
I think you know for for me a lot of a lot of what the the military have done when they're deploying you know overseas that they're, they're actually a, you know kind of a, a beacon of hope for for that for that community you know when you have when you have a, an, an an army uh, or a military based you you actually think you know this is this is a better life this is a better this is the version the better version of a better regime um, a better future, um, even a, be a better food. Uh, how can we actually make it better for the environment as well? And I think all of our solutions here are, are also also you know going towards towards that goal of, of a more uh, environmental um, aspect of, of generating energy. Right. Well, let me let me come in on that just to, as well, if you don't mind. That there's. What we believe in is, is in a truly circular economy that, for example, you make tires or plastics out of polymers that are created out of uh, uh, natural gas and oil. And what we do is we take those, we turn them into the building blocks that enable them to either be reused and uh, like the carbon black uh, reused in tires, the steel goes back into tires and the biochar that's produced goes black back into the ground to nurture the ground. So we have a fully circular economy that waste is minimal and uh, we're using everything. It's sort of decarbonization is important. We decarbonize as well because of these byproducts that don't have to be remanufactured. So that's all of us have the same kind of theme involved here and it's wonderful. Great. Right. And I could I could add just one thing and, and sure. about that. So uh, one of the materials that we use for storage is a, is a molten salt. And one of the things about the way we have approached this technology is the salt is contained in carbon steel to reduce cost. But the important thing about it is it does not degrade. That means that we can charge or discharge without regard for the state of charge or rate of charge. But it also means it's a perpetual asset. At the end of, of the project's uh, useful life, that salt is still useful. It can be reused, uh, repurposed, recycled, or if it needs to be disposed of, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a toxic waste. It's, it can be uh, uh, actually further processed into a fertilizer. So all of those things I think are important as we look at, at the, what, we do, what we do with our components uh, we need to be thinking about the, the life cycle and either it is going to be reused in some way or we have, a, have technologies that transform it back into the basics. Yep. Great. So listen, guys, uh, we're, we're coming to the end of the session here. We only got a few more minutes, but what I'd like for you, each one of you guys to do, given the, the esteemed audience that we have, is what are the next steps? What do you want them to know of how they can take your technology. Are you looking for pilots? Are you looking, obviously we're all looking for orders, but what, what is the next steps that you want our audience to know about moving forward with your technology? And I'll start off maybe with Henry first. Sure, uh, we're already putting a plant that will take tires as a feedstock and there's 88 tons of them per day and generate steam for a city in Ohio. Uh, we certainly have different sizes of these systems, all the way down as low as 10 tons per day to 20 to 40 to 80 metric tons a day. And uh, the energy output it depends upon the feedstock. And we're happy to discuss anyone that has an idea of the ability to use this technology for continuous power generation. Great, thank you, Henry. What about you, Kobe? So, so I, th I think for us, and, and it's you know fundamentally, we want to make sure that our solution is answering a problem. So I think we we would like to partner with people uh, that that will tell us, yes, this is something we need, we want, and this is the way we want to deploy it. Um, again, right now, in terms of the technology, we are at the TRL seven. And, and we're looking to deploy you know, our first commercial unit at the end of this year. Um, so, so working, working with the DOD, working with uh, people that have problematic waste, that's, that's our way for us to, 
to get into that market. Great, thank you, Kobe. Bill? So what we've done is we, we take everything that's in this system that we provide is a proven component. Gas turbines or engines, uh, 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 steam cycles, uh, heat transfer equipment, molten salt, it's all been used before. It just hasn't been put together in this unique way that we have. So what that means is that these, this is a technology that is really ready to go commercially. Uh, we have a backing from, uh, from all the equipment vendors, of course, they're interested, but, but more importantly from the engineering community as well. So, uh, and, and gas turbines and engines, they're available at whatever scale you need. So I think that uh, uh, we, we can uh, help solve problems uh, uh, virtually any place and at any scale. Great, thank you, Bill. So for Genso, for myself, is that, you know, we're an engineering company that we're using uh, hydrogen fuel cell technology as a means to an end. At the end of the day, what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize the risk associated to losing power or even just having power available in any capacity. And we are very active in wanting to do pilots and partnering up with uh, the, the audience in, on this call to say we have a specific problem related to power and we want to come up with a solution. And any of my fellow panelists, I'm sure, can come up with some sort of solution depending on the requirements. But for our specific application is that we're actually creating applications for deployments, easy, quick deployments that you can harvest hydrogen from any of my counterparts here on this panel. We can use that hydrogen, harness that hydrogen, utilize that hydrogen and or ammonia, that's also another common material, and be able to apply it in a way that will give you much better functionality than using traditional diesel fuel uh, or fossil fuel driven uh, engines. So we're looking, we're actively looking for pilots and partnerships that we can work with, with anybody on this call that would require power. And that I'm sure is for any of the panelists that are on this call. So thank you very much for your time today. Hopefully it was educational. Hopefully you were able to see how this type of technology can really support uh, the islanding theme that we talked about in terms of being able to harness the power reutilize a lot of the waste that are typically within the base or military uh, application and, and be able to turn that into something that's useful, viable, and lowers the risk of not having power, which makes everything else possible. So thank you very much for your time today. panelists. Thank you very much for your insight and your knowledge transfer. And uh, hopefully we will uh, get some more calls uh, to actually start working with the government. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you.